been uh, John DeVore from Sacramento. Uh, near Sacramento. Near Sacramento. Yeah. And uh, I'm Scott Ailes with uh, myself. <laughs> My wife Deborah and I have been in the car business 41 years. And we came across this 1933 Alfa Romeo through our good friend Bill Nuccio in Chicago. He actually um, was attending church with a gentleman for 10 years. And he's been talking about this car for a long time. We finally, uh, I met up with the gentleman, Brian Watkins, and we bought the car in Cincinnati. And he priced it kind of low, so Bill and I decided to uh, bring him in as a partner. So the three of us are now partners on the car, and John's here to discover as much as we can about what this car is and what it's not. And we've had quite a bit of discovery so far. So John, tell, us, yeah. tell everybody that doesn't know you, because I'm going to be pushing him hard, because if you have a car like this, or a pre-war Alpha or... Italian yeah, letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really owe it to yourself to have John come spend time with you and your car. It's been fabulous so we far. Can, we can learn something together because we have her. It's been really interesting. So we're going to get into some of that. So John, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do. I grew up with interesting old Italian and British and other kinds of cars around the yard. that My father collected and rescued a lot of cool stuff. And I was fortunate to work on some early racing Alpha 8Cs and uh, Grand Prix cars and other things for other people and developed an appreciation for these cars and also learned that there are some little hidden secrets in them that can sometimes uh, imply or reveal history. Might be. We might have to be closer. So it's, oh. the camera would be good. But yeah, there you go. Uh, the, the volume or the okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, cars can tell us a lot if we look under their skirts. Um, and we've been looking under the skirts of this one and uh, having a good time uh, revealing little things here and there. Yeah. We knew some things were not original just based on them not being Italian. Uh, although that's never a guarantee because uh, Alfa Romeo did source some of their parts from Germany. So not all of their parts were, were Italian in the first place, much to the chagrin of Mussolini. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to jump in and kind of follow John around. Um, we're trying to basically understand uh, as much as we can about this car and we we knew that the we had a suspicion I want to say we knew anything but we had a suspicion that the front fenders or wings as they are called I guess I'm learning a lot of this stuff now uh, were not probably on the car when it was born uh, the fact that it's all been filled in is indicative of that we did take that big steel plate that was on the front that the guy used to pull it around and John uh, allowed me to beat that aluminum uh, English license plate back into submission today and torture his ears a little bit. But uh, you know, wherever you want, John, just just kind of bring everybody everybody up to speed what we've discovered so far and what we've seen. Well, working in other examples of these cars, I found that there's typically a chassis number at the right rear, typically a frame number at the left front. Sometimes people stamp another copy of, this, of the chassis number up here at the, at the left front. This frame horn, unfortunately, was heavily damaged in an accident in the past, and somebody's welded steel over the whole area that would probably reveal a frame number, probably some, somewhere a few inches back from the very front of this chassis. So without cutting that metal off and hopefully finding the remains of that number, we're not going to find the frame number easily, but that's not a big deal. We have enough evidence to say this is a 6C, 6 Series 6C GT chassis, which would have been a 1900 CC car, also called 6C 1900. And we have it in the back. Yeah, we'll go to the back. Yeah, we'll, go to the back. we'll go to the back. We did find it on the back. Yes. It should come through the camera. We'll pick it up. Yeah. But there's a chassis number back here, and it's uh, it fulfills our expectations. The only surprise there was is that early in the process of stamping the numbers, somebody misstamped one of the digits and uh, that uh, uh, resulted in the chassis number being being possible to misread as one two one three one five one one four instead of five two one four but it is five two one four and what are these crazy things tell them about these these, <laughs> these are Seattle dampers that are controlled by the oil pressure from the dash so you could adjust the uh, the damping rate of the rear dampers from the dashboard but their dashboard control is no longer there and uh, they're cut off so the, the hydraulic tubes that would carry the pressure to the units are is no longer attached to anything and about 20 minutes ago let's walk over to the other side and show them what we discovered about whether or not these might have been 
born on this car or not. Some interesting discovery here. The um, Ferrari, Scuderia Ferrari, which was a, a, a private, com private uh, organization that was racing Alfa Romeos, uh, featured an advertisement for the Shiata shocks. They're called uh, Telesnub. Um, Tele for the fact that you can control them from a distance and snub for the fact that that's a, a, a different way of saying damper is a snubber. And uh, these were being advertised as of 1932 by Scuderia Ferrari and also in other magazines, 1932-33. So this was an available option for any car or a privateer could install them on their car. This appears probably to have been installed from new. No way we can guarantee that. We're curious. We're, we, nothing's absolute in these old cars, but we've got a, a we've kind of gone through layers of paint with the dry ice machine, and we've gotten down to this dark blue that we believe is the last layer of paint before you hit metal, and we found some blue on the original junction here that leads us to think possibly that these were on the car when it was new. We also had an interesting discovery over here on the inside of the fender well. And you'll see some interesting little bolts underneath here and some holes that we excavated with the dry ice. And if we come around on the top side, John, what are these? What's going on here? Well, this is a steel fender or wing, and it appears these are the bolt holes that hold down running board strips that would have run forward. And there were three of them in this instance, three running forward probably into the front fender, but it no longer has the front fender that there was originally there or the, or the running board. So we have just this remnant of what the styling cue was for those running board strips. Cool, and then, oh, our lovely trafficators. Probably the other side oh, might the, be better. Oh, trafficators, yes. I never knew what a trafficator was till we bought this car. <laughs> this is an interesting uh, feature on this car. It was updated at some point with trafficators, probably while in England, almost certainly in England, it's a trafficator feature. Um, so there were, Italians did use trafficators as, as well, but these appear to be British. And what happened was, is that this louver here was actually one of three, one here and then one here. And these two louvers have been eliminated to fit the trafficator. And this louver and this louver and this louver would have provided ventilation to the interior through a little trap door and an interior door panel. Let me see if I can find that here. There it, is. there it is. So inside this foot well is a kick panel and this little door sitting inside can be opened to allow air in and out. Well, the traffic gators are blocking most of the air, but you can still get a little bit of air inside. <laughs> and then we got these lovely little doodads down here that could have been either let's see look real close we've got two little screws, screws on the nuts there there are nuts on the inside and those could have been either for a coach builder badge or a dealer badge more likely a coach builder badge than a dealer badge but dealers were known to put badges in certain places but generally on a dashboard or some other place inside the car but and then uh, this is a good clue to whatever the badge might have been that was on this car when it was made new and then, of course, the data plate, this is where we started. You know, my, Mr. I don't know nothing about these. I, I put a lot of credence in this at first, but then it, it, appropriately, everybody was suspicious, like, well, that, that could mean anything. And so it does, at this point, turn out to be that, as it says, a Tipo 6C GT6 series with motor number and chassis number that fits save for... Except for the crankcase in this crank case. Crankcase. Now, this is a great learning experience. I kind of knew this, but I had just forgotten myself. You know, modern engines today, they don't have a crankcase and then a... Hold on a minute. Uh, don't, don't, don't do it, John. Blocco cilindri. Don't do it. Blocco cilindri. <laughs> uh, don't do it. I had to text it to myself, and now I can't... So I hate this 60-year-old memory. I got the cylinder block and the cylinder yeah. head. Yeah. So we got crankcase, right. cylinder block, right. cylinder head. And so in this case, we're confident that this cylinder head and block are from the 1900 original series car. And the 
we know the crank case has a, uh, we'll get to the other side, has a brass plate on it that says it's from a 1500 series. 60, 1500, very early car, a very, very early car. And so the question from a lot of people was, you can't put a, a twin cam aluminum 1900 6C head on a 1500 block. But what the missing part there was that it's not, it's on the original. It could well be that some work had to be done to make it happen, but it appears that it's been done. Yeah. So, yeah. and then the aluminum sump on the underside is also a 1900 aluminum sump. So it's a, it, with a larger capacity than a 1500 would have had. Yeah, we're kind of surmising that we had a broken car somewhere in the 50s and 60s. And, and it, it could well be that the accident damage that took out the left front dumb iron that required that repair also knocked the steering box mount off of this side because it's not a very strong area of the casting. And so the steering box mount on this side oftentimes gets damaged when a car has an accident at the steering box. All right, so, and we, we documented the steering box to be uh, proper numbers. It's proper numbers and ratio. There's a, a number here and a ratio here, and those those all tie in. And, and we got we know it's a different carburetor and manifold, but we have what looks to be uh, in a bo parts box. It the, could well be the original carburetor. Right, the Solex carburetor. Um, let's go ahead and close this side of the hood and we'll open the other side up. We've done a little work over here. We did successfully uh, pull the plugs and a little mystery oil has, oil has been in the block for a while. And so we successfully turned the engine over with the starter. Um, so that was kind of fun. Uh, it, it turned over quite easily. And so now we're just kind of working with it. We, we pulled the the oil plug, which is basically the filter, you pull the oil plug and there's a two stage filter. It's a screen and we're cleaning that and we're going to try to get this thing to pump up with some oil pressure. So we did a little dry ice cleaning uh, on the side of the block here and you can see uh, it looks pretty interesting. You can see there's the aluminum uh, crankcase. No, nope. mm -hmm. yes, it is. Yes, yes that's aluminum the aluminum crankcase. Crank is this part from here to here. And that's the 1500 mm -hmm. series. And, and then, it also has a crankcase number, which is different than the engine number, but it fits into the pattern of crankcase numbering for these cars. Yeah, and we checked the number on the back of the head. We checked the number on the valve, the cam covers. They all match the gear cover here. The gear cover, and and then explain this. What's this goofy situation uh, here? Originally, there would have been a float inside the chamber here, and it would have, has a wire, um, a stand a stand indicator basically with a with a line on it and that line would typically run between the marks here to show you whether you were full or low or too low and uh, that is no longer present in this and a dipstick was made up and tomorrow when we add some oil to this we will try to calibrate that dipstick because we have no confidence that we know actually what amount of oil was in there when we started cranking today <laughs> and then for those of you that don't know like me What's missing in the front of this motor? There's no fan. No, What's there's the no story? supercharger. That's the big important part, but it's not supercharged. So it's not supposed to have a supercharger. Yeah. But no fan. What's the story with the no fan, John? Um, these cars didn't really need a fan. They had water, enough water in the system, and there's no traffic in those days when these cars were made. You never had to send it a stoplight. There were no stoplights. You might have to stop for a car, turn the engine off, or for a... Uh, or a car or a horse or something else, but you didn't have to stop for traffic normally. You would just drive from here to there and stop the car when you didn't run. And uh, there was enough capacity. These ran very, very large cooling systems and it took a while for them to overheat if you did stop and run them for a while. They have an efficient water pump down the side. It's, uh, it's run by the same shaft that drives the oil pump and also the generator here on this side. So there's a cross shaft and uh, one wear area on these engines is that the, the cross shaft gears can wear and then you lose your drive both to the generator and to the water pump and the oil pump. Or the oil pump and water pump in that, in that order. What's the bracket on the back of the head with the, looks like tripod with a hole, looks like a spring goes in there or something. What's oh, now you're testing me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what this is for in this instance. Huh. Well. Oh, biggie. So uh, we don't get to see very many 16, 1900 or 1900 GTs uh, surviving these days. I have seen a couple of cars, both were heavily, heavily modified, no longer resembled anything original. 
This is modified, but still resembles a car that's quite original in many, many ways. But we'll be learning a lot from this to know more about other cars when we see them. Yeah, we did. We went through that same process with the dries down here on this brake drum. So it's basically uh, started out with this color, and then we went through to the silver, and then we went through to the blue. So we're, all, all indications point toward this car having blue chassis underneath and who knows we don't really know on the body because the we know that these front fenders are definitely not original because no. those fancy aerofoil brackets they literally look like an airplane wing oh, well <laughs> I, I believe the aerofoil brackets uh was somebody's idea of a joke at the time a good joke but uh the, the, uh, this this car's ground effects were either improved or unimproved by the by the aerofoils but the wings definitely came later, probably not at the same time as those bracket covers. Yeah, because we know that aerofoils are fiberglass. So, well, in this yeah. case, they're fiberglass, certainly. They can be made, the wing structures can be made of uh, alloys. Yeah, and sure. Alloys of steel and, and aluminum, usually aluminum. But in this case, this is fiberglass. So that's probably something that somebody did around 1960 or later. Yeah. And we know that it was, had, it was this way when it came to the USA in 1965. 1965, so, yeah. So somewhere in that window, somebody had a good time making an aerodynamic improvement to the undercarriage. And then I was fascinated. I asked John, I said, what is the story with this radiator? Radiator, actually the bottom five or six inches of the radiator is covered up. Now let's raise it up a little bit and we'll show everybody. By the new Other other side, yeah. By the newish wings. Newish wings, aluminum wings. <laughs> I gotta get used to calling them wings. For now, yeah, on the locks, yeah, and coming down, you can come down now, it'll, there we go, so there's basically this gap in here that the radiator actually comes way down here, but it's actually covered up about five or six inches, so what, what's the story there? Uh these were so overcooled, it didn't matter that you covered up that area. It was the capacity that was more important than the amount of air that was flowing through them. In fact, most times when these cars run in uh, warmer climates, it's good to blank off part of the radiator when you go out, and it'll run warmer and more efficiently. And, and certainly nothing that would have been done in 33 where they bonded. There's actually screws coming through. Oh no, it's clear, here. It's clear that you have, you have wings, then there's a, a piece that's been Goobered inserted in here. And we haven't taken it apart to look at it because it's not gonna teach us anything about the car. Yeah. It's just a portion of the car's history that uh, somebody did something, it probably seemed cool at the time, but yeah. it probably will not last on the car beyond the uh, restoration. And then we saw these, uh, what do you, are they dampeners or are they, you call them shock absorbers? They're, they're or? dampers or shock absorbers. Shock absorber is actually a, a misnomer in the, from what they actually do. Damper is more correct, but we use shock absorbers in the American English. And so this particular, we started taking a little bit of this weird paint that's yellowed and there's some red underneath here and a little red spot here and blue. So we took a little off just to be able to see it. So if anybody recognizes the blue and the red and might find that uh, to be, how do you pronounce it again? Siata. Yeah. Yeah, the, the dampers at the rear, hydraulically adjustable, are Siata. These could also be Siata, but mechanically adjustable by screwing the, uh, the the disc here tight or loosened, and it pushes on a spring, which then clamps the uh, the discs together. So it's just a friction shock absorber with with uh, some adjustability to it. And for those that aren't really familiar, like myself, I wasn't either. Uh, you know, you're looking at this car, you're like Jesus, a ratty old car. Uh, it's a fairly important car and you know it, it, people could you could go on and on about values about what cars are and John and I joke about that while we're spending time together about you know he everybody always wants to know what what's this worth you know what's what's it worth well we don't really know but it's 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 a it's an important car in the alpha history it's the year that they I don't know if they filed bankruptcy but Mussolini bailed them out I understand with the government finance division, kind of like what happened in 08 with the, some of our manufacturers here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Enzo Ferrari was involved with the Alfa race, race team. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in 33. They made, I think 197 from what we know approximately of the 1906C, that's is that mm -hmm. accurate? Roughly. To, to the degree that yeah, we know, we yeah. Don't, we don't know for sure that all chassis were completed the same way as cars, um, record, Alfa records don't, don't exist today so yeah um, so the answer to the question about value we don't know
um, it, it, it's worth what someone uh, wants to pay for it, and I guess we'll get around to that eventually. I don't think Deborah's going to let me keep this one and restore it, although there's a part of me that would like to do the same thing we did with, oh, hang on. There we go. The Riva, those of you that know us know that we had a Riva restored with our partner friend, Ron Millardo, and we sold that in 2010. So that was a fun restoration project that we actually made a little bit of money on. Um, so anyway, we'll see where it goes, but we'll, we'll eventually find out about the value. Who knows? Uh, all right, I want to go all the way up and we'll tour around underneath. We had to, we had to make a couple of uh, adjustments. <laughs> Okay, settled. All right, so uh, one of my favorite things I will show you. Yeah, it's better on the other side. The chloride battery box with beautiful joinery on the edges. I just think that's cool. Uh, so we had to do a little uh, adjustment here, so we don't know why necessarily, but this is the break. So you yeah. want to explain how you no know, hydraulic brakes here so what's going on here there's a big we lever up above case, we bled on the brakes rather than bleeding the brakes okay? <laughs> all right basically there's a handbrake lever here that, that when you pull it there it pushes this forward it's like stepping on the brake pedal this lever when when it goes forward pushes this one back and that pulls on this and this and well, actually, the brake pedal goes here and comes to here and does the same thing as the handbrake lever back here. But when you step on it, this moves back, which pulls on the pull rods here, which put, which runs on these little transfers that do pull rods going to the front brakes. At the rear, these rods get pulled forward to actuate the rear brakes. So this system works very, very well for a mechanical system when you get everything adjusted just right. But you have to start on each corner, adjust everything perfectly on each corner, and then work towards the center of the car so that all the angles are correct on all of the pull, bar, pull rod arms. And then once you've got all of that stuff set up correctly, then you use the secret method of jacking the car up, putting it on four jack stands that are the same height, and do two or three clicks on the handbrake. You adjust the rear brakes to drag a little bit, you adjust the front brakes to drag a little bit more. And then you go out and test it, and if it's good, thumbs up if it isn't good and you go and do the process. We ran into something. <laughs> this thing can settle in and then it won't, won't behave a second time the way it did the first time. <laughs> and we're still discovering uh, about this body. We don't we don't really know. Uh, Castagna, Pininfarina. It was, it was offered at one time having a James Young body. It's clearly not a James Young. That was changed in that description to being Castagna. Maybe. I've seen a Castagna, and I kind of doubt it's Castagna, but the body number that we found is 1397. Where did we find that? Some wood pieces inside, very nice wood pieces inside. So yeah. there's some burl laid on top of some very nice, clean, older lumber that's uh, very, very nicely done. It's still very nicely preserved for the most part. Um, 1397 there, and then I had to take a bunch of British stuff off in the doors to get to... Um, some, some steel parts in the mecha latch mechanism that were marked also with that same number with the nice deep stamping. And then the latch uh, um, strikers were also, once those, those are removed, those are also numbered with those numbers. And I'm sure we'll find more 1397 numbers on this as we disassemble things elsewhere. But um, I don't know for sure yet which coach builder is responsible. But yeah. for, we've got some clues now with the louvers that we found. In sure. The, the, there's some angle features to that which are coming in around 1933 with Pininfarina. Could be, not necessarily Stellamente Farina was also where Pininfarina, Batista Pininfarina came from. So it could be that they were doing some things similarly at the same time. Um, other copy, other uh, coach builders were copying each other too. So um, at the moment, many possibilities. It would be very rare if it was a Castagna, it would be rare if it was a Pininfarina, probably perhaps even rarer as Salamente Farina. Um, yeah. Sometimes rarity is based on what we know rather than what was done. Sure. And we uh, we did find some crayon marks. He, he made a comment to me in a text, found a, found a crayon marking and, uh, what was the other part, a stamp or something? 
Well, right. no, it was basically, I said, well, that's when I found the numbers on the wood pieces you were yeah. there. I said, I found some crayon mark. I said, told you the body number. You asked where, where did you find it? Yeah. The crayon markings on the wood and number metal standings in the. Uh, in the uh, yeah, that's right. So, so I'm like, I was like, crayons, really? Huh? 1933? Yeah. So, they could have been pencil marks. Well, but I mean, the point, it caused me to like, I got to check him up. So I, I Googled crayons, 1903. Crayons have been around a long time. The wax even longer. Yeah. Know, yeah. So I, very... I found numbers painted inside of doors. You find them uh, penciled. You find them scratched on the bottom side of floor panels, painted on the bottom side of floor panels sometimes. Yeah. And different coach builders did different things, typically. You know, a lot of people have asked, you know, oh, are you going to preserve the car? Is it a preservation car? After spending a couple of days in depth here with John, we both agree and believe that it's it's not a preservation car with with having had so many modifications the front wings and we don't really know if the back fenders are original and if this wacky spare tire uh bracketry but we we definitely know on the inside there we know that's not that's not well, factory I mean, original there and, aren't really many painted surfaces greater than this that yeah. are, are worthy of salvation yes yeah. yes so we think this is going to be a restoration for somebody at some point, and uh, who that is, I don't know. It, according to Deborah, it's not going to be us. <laughs> so, uh, 41 years with her, and I got to give her some credence, and she's made some pretty good judgment calls, especially even lately. So, uh, anything else you can think of, John, that we've discovered has been interesting, or? Well, it's been nice to find that virtually all the mechanical components are original too this car or a car like this and there's no reason to think they aren't original to this car aside from the crankcase yeah so rear end and transmission and you've got some little tricky spots that i'll well just i'll let you keep those to yourself <laughs> where, where, where those are. oh tell them about the brake drum back here so one of my oh, friends oh, oh, one oh, of my friends oh, walked in and says today yeah earlier today he says, says what's what, the story what, what happened to this or what why, why is this this way and i said well Probably a wheel came off and somebody slid to a stop on a brake drum and, and sure enough we he cleaned this up afterwards and there's scratch marks running along here as if it slid to a stop on the brake drum. So it and did. It's, it's got the angle here where the different this depth is different one side to the other as if that wheel was still on and it just went the car would drop down, yeah. The left rear and, and slid to a stop. That's great. Yeah, that's the part of the you know car's history. Oh no, you... no, it was lightened for racing. That was yeah, 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 right, yeah. 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 They shaved that off, just that side, that <laughs> one piece. Yep, yep. Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate. Uh, there's, I had to take the exhaust off to get this thing on the lift because the exhaust ran right down the frame rail, and so I broke one bolt. But every other thing, every little cotter pin, every little thing we've touched, has been really pretty agreeable. We haven't had any uh, problems in that regard. It's. It's a little nice to have a little dry ice to, uh, we did and, just. And I would say, yeah, the dry ice, cleaning, yeah, cleaning of those uh, fasteners before you take them apart can reduce the, uh, the, the uh, resistance yeah. to them coming off. We did these nuts really good just to kind of show what's possible. You know, it's how nice is it to be able to see very closely but exactly. You fix this cotter pin, boy, that's pretty ugly. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we joked about the restoration began. What was the first thing we did? The restoration has begun. <laughs> Besides me beating yeah. on the license plate. You just stepped on the slippery slope. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know, it was this thing. It was the brake thing underneath here. Oh, yeah. That we talked about, yeah, we fixed yeah. that. Yeah, but here's the starter. You know, the starter just, sure enough, a little power here and a little short from here to here, and away it goes. It's, I was shocked how easy it turned over and how well it turned over. Oh, look at this. Oh, did you see this? Mm. I never, I, I can see it from above. The minimum, maximum. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I say there's a little float that goes inside with a, an indicator that floats between the minimum and maximum. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. so we're, tomorrow we're going to determine what our dipstick, the dipstick that had been made. Because we know how that. much is supposed to be in there. We, we're going to put the amount that's supposed to be in there that will uh, go ahead and make our dipstick tell us the same thing. Lovely. Awesome. But Copies. somebody else in the future will want to go ahead and, want to go ahead and replace that float arrangement, I'm right. sure. And, of course, you know, again, you know, not, not original because you know, we got to we got to follow through from here to here. Plus, somebody well, somebody put a plug, a wood plug in there where you normally put a crank. Well, when this is three inches below, three or four inches below the surface that you received from the top. So this right. this, this area, which could be kind of an original shape, um, but, and then filled already at that time, has now become filled at a higher level. So, yeah. Um, and, of course, we don't have any front or rear bumpers, so presumably this is where a bumper would might have mounted 
would, would have mattered, most likely. Yeah. And, and this one being canted somewhat inwards here at the top is another indication that something happened Some here. activity, yeah, sure enough, you can see that really easily. But this whole front area here is boxed sides and top and bottom with, uh, with extra steel. It's right. Been welded, welded to create a, another box around whatever distorted metal is inside there. Yeah, so you can see the the holes in the inside of the frame, which was indicative of just the, the 1900. Six, of the six series, six series, either Grand Sport or the uh, Tur Grand Turismo. And so this should not be like this. It no. Should... no, you can see the hole here and the holes on this side. Are this is how this. it should look right over yeah. here. But even this side is tweaked a little bit. You can see the little yeah. puckers in the steel. Yeah, and should have a bumper here. So there's all there's, kinds of little... rubber insert missing, and the whole framework for that is missing over here. All kinds of stuff. We got a little play here that we just played around with everything and steering and the brakes. And yeah, it's it's pretty interesting piece. Let's bring it down, and we'll do our parting shot uh, together. And... Uh... <laughs> Keep going. There you go. Go ahead and lower it to the top. Yeah. And there it is. Okay, so uh, again, I want to stress that you know it was, it was we came by it was it two nights ago. I picked up at the airport in Orlando, and we came by for first impressions, and first impressions turned into a little dry icing and because John's walking around the car uh, pointing within three micrometers of where every number is supposed to be on every part uh, from my humble opinion and so it was just so simple to go squirt here and shoot there and shoot there it's like number 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 and those numbers matter and they're important and you know without this kind of knowledge you know, I, I think the hobby's in real peril. We we really got to get the younger folks involved. And if you have one of these cars, again, and, I said and some this, older folks. And as I was gonna say, <laughs> you know, the older folks are like yeah. you. You've coveted and you had this car for even a short period, a long period. You know, take the time to really uh, get with John or someone like John that's really at the height of the marquee uh, or the mark, I should say, uh, that knows this stuff. And and you know, leverage that. And and it's. It's very satisfying as a 60-year-old car guy. Uh, been in it for 41 years. You know, there's the 20s and 30s when I was hustling and trading just to try to, you know, make a living and get by. Now I'm in the passion side of my career, and it's fun. It really has been pleasant. I mean, there's a lot of things I should be doing. Some of you people that might see this video is like, you're supposed to be working on my car. Well, you know, I'm trying to squeeze it all in as best I can. So. Uh, really been a great experience and we're going to spend some more time cleaning some pieces and parts and we got a little more time tomorrow we're going to spend together to see if we can get some oil pressure in that motor. Mm -hmm. I think we will now that we've got those screens clean. Those, those, those clogged up. They were nasty. Yeah, yeah, nasty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty cool system. It's like these two screens, one fits inside the other and they go up where the drain plug would normally be in a normal car and then there's these holes from the side that drain into that, so if that's if it's plugged from the sump, yeah, yeah, it's it not. Wasn't, it wasn't going to pick up any. Not going to pick nothing up, not the way it was. <laughs> yep. So it turns over beautiful. We lubed uh, both cams, and the cams look good. There's no problems that we can see visibly. Uh, you know, cars missing a few pieces. John's got one of these. We might grab that from him and, and include it with the car when we do sell. We're going to sell it. I don't know if we're going to sell it the way it is or if we're going to restore it, but. It's fun so far, and I'm really having a lot of uh, interesting uh, experiences and learning, which is really the key. So I always say, don't necessarily buy cars for investments and to make money. Um, you know, decide what the car means to you. What kind of experience do you want to have with the car? You want to drive it? You want to show it? You want to restore it? You, you know, there's any number of things that you could do with any car. Determine what the experience, like you don't come home from vacation and say, oh, I lost my rear end on that vacation. You say I had a great time or you had an immodest time or whatever, you might not do it again. But, but you know, with cars, you know, there's just a handful of cars that people could say, oh, if I'd have kept that car from 1960 or 1930, you know, I'd have millions now. Well, you might as well bought Apple stock or 
you know, it's gone to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, well, it's happened to all of us. Yeah. If you're a car guy yeah, it's, yeah, or gal, yeah, yeah. it's happened to you yeah. for sure. And so, my father a bunch of times. Yeah. Enjoy the experience. I guess that's the point. Decide what your experience is going to be, and then go after it. But this experience that's happening the last few days and tomorrow, I highly recommend. And uh, don't be cheap. Just do it. It's, he's not expensive. He's very fair. And I highly recommend that you reach out to John. Well, did it pay? Oh. Oh shoot. <laughs> Oh, no, okay. that's been a good time. It's been a good time learning from this car. Well, it's fun. And it's nice, too, because we know that some of the stuff that he's learning here could be valuable to someone else someday. So, you know, even though there's a business relationship here, it's still a passion relationship. And I can tell, I knew instantly. He just starts rattling stuff off about Alpha and history and, and the first dinner we had before we sell the car. And I knew, that like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. So this is really going to be fun. So... Uh, sorry for all the wacky camera issues in the beginning. That's going to probably continue to happen because I don't really care. So I'm not trying to make pretty videos and satisfy the entertainment side of YouTube. This is about uh, the car passion side. And so you got to suffer through my crappy camera uh, abilities. And I want to thank John again. Uh, handshake one more day yeah. and then we'll, we'll let you go back and do your report. And, and listen, this is a completely transparent deal. I don't know what we're going to do this car. But there's no secrets and we're not going to hide nothing. Whatever we find out, good, bad, or indifferent, that's what we're going to go with. Am I going to restore it? I don't know. We'll see what kind of feedback I get from uh, Miss Deborah. So, until later, we'll see you. Have a great day.